an interview last week. So this took us over four hours to go through the allegations and talk about them. And I did want to mention that I had a lot of people contact me with viewer questions. So we were not able to go through all of your view viewer questions like we wanted to. And I wanted to make a quick note that we will be doing extra sessions between Corey and I so we can talk about more Q&A and things like that. So first of all, thank you so much for submitting your questions and we will get to those here in the future as well. So I hope you guys enjoy the interview. Also, if you would like to enjoy more exclusive content from me, feel free to go over to my Patreon and subscribe there. Bye. Hi, this is Teresa at Divine Frequency. <laughs> and we've got Corey Good here with us. Hello. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. So I'm going to do a quick intro about you so that the viewers know who you are. For those who don't know Corey Good, at the age of six, he was inducted into the military abduction program. He was identified as an intuitive empath. And he was part of this program until he was 17. Mm -hmm. And then he was taken into the secret space program where he was a part of what's called the 20 and back where you go out into the space program. He talks about bases on the moon and Mars, all kinds of information brings it back. He did this program three times. And what I mean by that is that when you come back from the 20 and back, you are age regressed and time regressed. So you come back to when you were 17, this happened three times. So he served 60 years in the secret space program came back as a 17 year old, lived the rest of his life and met his wife and has kids. And then around a certain point, I don't know when, maybe 2012, 2013, started connecting to people online through a pseudonym. And then at some point came out into the public eye around 2015. He has a show on Gaia TV called Cosmic Disclosure, where he talks about all of these experiences that he had off planet and even in the inner earth, all kinds of stuff. Cool, cool stuff. So thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you. Absolutely. So today in particular, we are going to talk about some of the recent things that have happened. So we all went to co or contact in the desert uh, a couple, when was that? A month ago, which was end of May, June, early June. Yes. Yeah. 2017. And you made some big announcements there. Can you tell us a little bit about the announcements that you made? Yeah, we, we made a number of them. Um, one of them is that uh, we're doing a book, a joint book. Uh, it's called The Case for a Secret Space Program. It's actually the same title as the MUFON Symposium this year. In the book, Dr. Sala, Dr. Woods, William Tompkins, and I are going to uh, write a book together. And uh, just recently, Jay Widener agreed to do a foreword and David Wilcock also has agreed to do a forward. So there are going to be two forwards to the book by uh, David and Jay. They have both vetted me and Tompkins. So that's really good to have their input. That's very exciting. That's yeah. super exciting news. But of course, we did talk about, uh, you know, we're working with trying to get a uh, series on Netflix mm -hmm. similar to Stranger Things. Um, that's still moving along. It takes like a year and a half to do that process. We're uh, working on a graphic novel as well. So yeah, there's probably uh, projects I forgot to mention. There's so many going on. <laughs> That's so exciting. I was actually there when you made those announcements and everybody in the crowd was super excited. Yeah. And um, yeah, especially about the book. I thought that that is so important. And especially because when you go into a bookstore and you want to find information about the secret space program it's really hard you go into all the different sections on military history you're not going to really find anything there you can look in conspiracy and you really don't really find much and i actually just went the other day to see if i could find anything and i didn't really see anything at all <laughs> right that's something i've been talking with dr sala a lot about um, he wants to get this information into colleges you know that's his exopolitics that's what he does so that's how a lot of this book is being geared not necessarily to, to sell just to the, like the UFO community. It's meant to be out there more mainstream. Um, you know, the mandate I was given was to bring this stuff more commercially to get it out there and get it mainstream so that uh, the mass consciousness will pick up on it and start to demand the release of these technologies. That's a big part of this plan. We're all, we want to release these technologies. And uh, the best way to do it is for us to come together uh, unify, but also through different projects uh, through the entertainment industry to help seed the mass consciousness. That must feel very empowering after all you've been through 
tumbling through this experience of realizing what you've been through and then connecting to how, how you sit now in the public eye and what that means for you. Yeah, it's empowering. Um, I, you know, I'm new to the public eye. So, you know, of course I've made mistakes and I've learned from them, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, it's pretty, it's a pretty intimidating process. I can imagine. And so as you have really made these huge strides in your career and started to connect with these people that have been corroborating your story over the last couple of years, some you're going to experience a little bit of turmoil in the beginning as people are trying to figure out who you are and what you stand for. And so since you came out with these announcing these projects, it seemed like in the last month or so, there have been a lot of people asking questions, really trying to understand you know, where you sit, where you come from, why you're here. And I thought that uh, this would be a good opportunity to ask you some questions. I know that you came to me a couple weeks ago or a few weeks ago saying that you wanted to make some public statements. So I would love to help you do that. I know that uh, there's been some controversies, but we can go ahead and move forward through that together. And I can. Right, right. And, uh, you know, I've spoken, you know, I speak to David Wilcock almost every day. And one of the things that he told me when I first started to get into this, I guess, business, if you want to call it, is that there are going to be haters. You're going to be attacked. Never, never, never respond. And that's how he has done. And it's worked great for him. And I've tried to do the same. It's been very difficult. I, I can take all of the, the, the really slanderous stuff coming out about me. But I've gotten pretty triggered when stuff started coming out, you know, about you and Roger, you know, people that I know are very, uh, have very good intentions and, and want to make a difference in this world. And to see them slandered like that upset me very deeply. And, you know, we have spoken with attorneys and one of the attorneys that talked to people in our group stated that it was a good idea to make a public statement. You know, because there's a lot of people out there that they're sick of this. I'm sick of this. They don't want to hear about it anymore. I don't want to hear about it anymore. But there's a certain percentage of the people that believe not responding is an admission of guilt. And those people have began, begun to really jump on the bandwagon. So I'm here to set the record straight. Sounds good. Yes, I know that a few of us have made our, uh, most of us have made our public statements of people that were involved in. I know you've been busy with filming at Gaia TV and everything, so you're back now, and we've had a chance finally to, to round up and do this. Yeah, so. I mean, when the attacks first occurred, it was, I was expecting them at Contact in the Desert. We, you know, we had been warned, but it really hit right after Contact in the Desert, and we were in the middle of filming Cosmic Disclosure. We had all this stuff going on. We could not respond. They, it all happened at a time to where we just didn't have the time to respond. And uh, it, was, it was pretty crazy. When you say that you were warned at Contact in the Desert, what, can you talk a little bit more to that? For weeks before Contact in the Desert, people were contacting us, just like they were contacting Jimmy Church, and it was, the scuttlebutt was out there, that, we, that uh, Project Avalon was formulating this huge takedown plan and that they were going to execute it at Contact in the Desert. I was told that they were going to do like they do Trump, you know, stand up and heckling during his speeches, to uh, show up like paparazzi with video cameras in my face, asking me, you know, about different allegations. And, you know, I was hearing all of this, and, uh, you know, it, you know, I was nervous. I had intrepidation. Um, told David, we told the people at Contact in the Desert, all of the stuff that was you know, being said, and they bumped up security. That's why David and I, we were going around with one to two security guards apiece because they were active threats. Did anything happen? No, no, but it was a pretty good psyop. I, I think that the people that were there, they were obviously there because they passed video and all this information back to uh, the attackers. Uh, I think they saw how much love was at this event. You know, the organizers of Contact in the Desert do a great job. It's, it's an awesome event. There's no place for, you know, hatred there. And uh, they knew that they would be drowned out. It would have been out of place. Yeah. It really would have been. <laughs> so, you know, I, was, I had a lot of intrepidation during that trip. And, of course, I was staying at the bed and breakfast as much as possible. Uh, we were, there were a few people that, you know, we didn't quite trust that we're trying to get into our inner circle that uh, 
we had, uh, we'd known that they'd been saying bad things about us and disparaging us. And then with us, they were acting like, oh, we're good friends, you know, and, and it just, you know, our sense, spidey senses were tingling big time. So we kept the people at arm's length. And uh, those people ended up uh, getting upset. But uh, to explain of why, to explain why we were so reserved and standoffish at contact in the desert, which was uncharacteristic, usually we're mingling. Uh, it was because of all the threats that we told were, we were told were coming. And then they came later. They did. <laughs> <laughs> they did. Yeah, it's crazy. You know, to sit there. You know, I know you. You know me. me and to hear some of the most slanderous lies, you know, talk you know, about people, especially like Roger, who's like the nicest he, guy yeah, in the world. He's intimidating looking with these tattoos. He's a big grizzly bear looking guy, but he's the most gentle, sweet guy and loving spirit that you'll ever meet. And uh, uh, nothing like what they're trying to report him as. It's, 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 it's crazy. Yeah, well, amazing what people will say when they're behind a computer screen and they don't really... Well, that's true. You know, there are a lot of narcissists and sociopaths out there, and the anonymity of the Internet emboldens them. So a lot of this trolling epidemic that's going on are just a lot of these, uh, these individuals that are, you know, they have those personality distortions. Well, I'm going to give you a few opportunities to, you know, make your public claims, and then um, I'm excited about what's coming in the next few months and once this is all behind us and we can just really focus on this book coming out and all mm -hmm. this other fun stuff. So yeah, an ancient I was recently on ancient Yeah, Alliance. tell us about that experience. That was oh. a great episode. Oh it was it was cool. Um it was they they found a mansion somewhere here in Dallas by SMU. Um I uh, drove out there with my assistant at the time and um uh, we did the interview. It went real smooth, real well. Uh, the producer was, uh, he was funny, laid back. It was, it, I mean, it was a very relaxed environment. Cool. Well, congrats on that. That was really, really cool to see you on Ancient Aliens. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I broke this into a few sections. I did a lot of research into the allegations and compartmentalized the interview so that we can kind of attack the attacks together. Right. So uh, the first section... And, and these are viewer questions? These are not... Well, okay. So it was really hard... When we made the public statement that we were going to be doing this interview because you wanted to address people's questions and the allegations that were coming out right. against you, uh, we opened it up to have people send me questions to my email, thedivinefrequency at gmail.com. And I received over 200 emails and they were questions... I mean, everyone was saying that they support you and they were, you know, excited to have questions for you. And none of them had anything to do with the allegations. I, I had two questions come in that had anything to do with the allegations. One about the blue avian hand signal that might be seen as what the Baphomet hand signal is. And then another one that I can't remember, but... Yeah, um, they were really they, reaching on that one. Yeah. Well, and, they, and it, nothing was rude. Like the, even the people that had a question about the allegations were just saying, Hey, I, I do support Corey. And this was my question. Yeah. So, I mean, there were obviously negative things that were being saying said on the YouTube and channel and the Facebook, but oh yeah, I mean, this is a, you know, love and light community. And it, a lot of us have backgrounds in Christianity. If someone comes up and, and does a major, a hit piece that makes someone look like a Satanist, there's a visceral reaction and people pull away. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. That, you know, that happened with Linda Bolton Howell, that happened with a, a bunch of different people. Mm -hmm. But now that they're seeing what has happened, some of them are starting to come back and they're like, okay, you know, that this was obviously, you know, a smear campaign not based in reality. Yes. Yeah, because a lot of the allegations, most of them were made without any research being done on the person. Like, particularly about me if they had done any research they would have seen that you know i have a, a journalism <laughs> yeah yeah i have a journalism background yeah. i have a degree in journalism and yeah. i also have a christian background too yeah. so. and, and but there's zero journalism then behind these i mean usually what happens is a source will come to a journalist and say i have this information they will investigate it a little bit vet it out and then go to the person who the information is about and say i have this information what is your side of the story right and then put together a real piece of journalistic work. Yeah. That's how it works. How What has been happening is more of the tabloid mm -hmm. kind of journalism. Yes, absolutely. And fake news. Yes. You know. There's been a lot of that actually across the board. It's insane how much of that is out there. Well, what's interesting is that 
the template that you see used out, you know, in, in mainstream, the, the fake news, uh, the uh, armies of trolls and protesters, mm -hmm. uh, hacking, uh, calling people uh, uh, Nazis or uh, racists or Satanists. Mm -hmm. It's the exact same template that mm -hmm. the deep state is using against the alliance. That now they're using it in alternative uh, in, uh Alternative media. What are you talking about that's so important, Corey Good? Yeah, really. <laughs> what is it about the secret space program that they do not want me to speak about or Tompkins to speak about? What is it about the Air Force narrative that's coming out that they want to support so heavily and that they have big names in the industry supporting? That's something that people should really look into and think about. Those are the big questions. Mm -hmm. Yes. So let's talk about the little questions really yes. quick. Let's get through the little questions. Yeah. But so to answer your question, I put these together myself. The, I put these questions. I took allegations. I grouped them and I'm going to give you a chance to respond. So that sounds very much like journalism. <laughs> well, here we are yeah. doing journalism. So um, the first section is going to, we're going to talk about why you got into this in the first place. So the allegations are to make money off of it, to destroy secret space program research, and to create a cult. So making it up for money. There was an interview on May 7th uh, with the dark journalist and Bill Ryan, and an hour in, uh, Bill Ryan states that when you came out with your testimony on Cosmic Disclosure that you told David Wilcock a whole swathe of stuff you had never mentioned in your original interview with Christine Anderson. You had also never mentioned this material in the two years prior that you had been posting on the Project Avalon forum. Bill Ryan says it was new material as if it was invented. So can you tell us about what material he's referring to and how would you respond to this? Okay. Guy? The prior two years on the forum, I was testing the waters, putting out little bits of information. That's what finally brought Bill Ryan or me to his attention to where him and Christine started to ask me a lot of questions. That's where, and that was at the end of the two years. So I would not have been talking about all of this secret space program stuff before I came out. So that doesn't make sense. Now, I spoke with Christine in a conversation to where it was the first time I was talking about it. I was overcoming uh, entity attachments and all these other things that were trying to keep me from being able to talk about it beforehand. If I try to talk about it, I'd go into an anxiety attack or I would start stammering really bad. It was, it was really weird. But, you know, after I used the name of Jesus Christ to rid entity attachments, I was able to talk about it for the first time. And then that's a conversation that uh, Christine Anderson captured. And then we did a, a second um, interview that wasn't very long that uh, was over Skype that was pretty poor audio quality. Um, that, uh, you know, I mentioned a little bit more in, but I did not have the opportunity to tell the rest of my story before, uh, you know, Bill Ryan had a big problem with me and turned on me over a silly disagreement between belief systems. You know, he didn't like me using the name of Jesus. He wanted that taken out of the uh, audio. Uh, he had this huge argument uh, based on Scientology about uh, what really occurs with entity attachments. I disagreed with him. And it just really kind of went haywire from there. Can you explain a little bit about entity attachments and what that is? Yes, through through different behaviors in life. You can get them through sexual contact. You can get them through, um, you know, negative contact with relatives that have entity attachments that have sociopath kind of tendencies. Uh, these entities anchor to trauma usually. And um, what I was able to do was identify them through a remote viewing session that they were there. I didn't know they were there before. And uh, there was one main one that called itself the gatekeeper. And I had, I thought I had gotten rid of it before, but I hadn't. And uh, Stacy said, why don't you use the name of Jesus? And I was like, hmm. I was a pre-ministry major, uh, raised by basically a minister. Uh, why didn't I think of that? You know, so um, I did. I started uh, calling out in the name of Jesus to rid me of uh, these attachments, and I started seeing them flying out. 
So do you see them through your third eye or do no, you feel was, them? Or This was a physical, I was sitting there and I was seeing uh, like shadows, uh, wispy shadows leaving me, just, you know, leaving. So you could see them with your physical eyes? Yes. Could yeah. Stacy see them? I was by myself. You were by yourself when that happened? I was okay. back in the bedroom, uh, you know, going through like a prayer and intercession kind of thing, wow. really trying to get rid of them because, you know, I, I was trying to talk about this information and I, I couldn't. So you finally had more of a chance to talk about the whole breadth of the story when you were working with David Wilcox yes. on Cosmic Disclosure. Right. And a lot of this information, you know, as I've stated openly, I was only wanting to provide researchers in the background. I did not want to be public. I'm a major introvert. Uh, getting in front of cameras or people is not my thing. Um, so, you know, I was providing David Wilcock with information, uh, you know, Bill Ryan with some, uh, things were starting to get sour there. <clears throat> and I reached out to Carrie Cassidy and I told her that I would love to give her information in the background that she could use to vet out, you know, her real sources. And that's the process where I became outed. Um, I had the Skype logs. I was speaking with Carrie Cassidy and, uh, on three different occasions, she asked me, when do you want to do an interview? Let's do an interview, interview, interview. And uh, I said, no. I said, I, it's a security risk for me. I can't do it. I will only do this anonymously. And after the third time of me saying no, she got frustrated and uh, did an article on her website, uh, Project Camelot, uh, with my name listed all in it. And then she did a video. I think my name was in there like six times. I was upset. I... Uh, contacted Google YouTube support. I forwarded all of the Skype conversations where I said I did not want my name used. I wanted to be anonymous. And uh, they pretty much forced her to uh, pull, down, pull down that uh, video. Okay, so you had a lot of information at this point of memories of everything you went through in the 20 and back that you had not had a chance to get out into the public eye. Right. So when you decided to go on Cosmic Disclosure with David Wilcock, how did you guys set up? Because it took seasons to get all that information out. I've watched almost all the episodes. Yeah. So w what did that plan look like? Well, originally, um, Gaia, they wanted me to come in. They've been looking for a good insider. And uh, they've been asking different people, you know, we want to do a show that's really hard-heading and covers disclosure. Uh, I had been talking with David, and David was trying, you know, he was like, listen, everybody knows who you are now after, you know, Carrie put your name out. Uh, you might as well come out to, to Gaia with me and talk with them, because they'd like to, you know, maybe do 10 episodes. So I sat down, and we, I, I had no idea what I was walking into. I, I walked into Gaia. They brought me into a room pretty much right away to where Jay Widener was in there. I didn't know who he was at the time. And there were two other people that I believe that were sitting there that are really well versed in everything ufology. And they grilled me and grilled me. And it was not in that one sitting, obviously, but it was over about, a, it was about 40 hours of them like really trying to trick me. And, you know, Jay Widener, when he was sitting across the table, was just sitting there going, you know, was looking at me, you know, this look he has of, I don't know whether to believe this guy or not. But by the end of the um, process, he had his jaw open. And uh, they said, okay, let's do 10 episodes. And we went, and I think we were in the middle of shooting those 10 episodes at, uh, to where I was approached by the, the upper brass. And they were saying, it sounds like you've got a lot more information you can talk about. How would you like to do 50 episodes? So I agreed, and uh, the rest is, I guess, history. So you planned out the first 10 episodes where you're like, okay, I'll touch on the basis of all of this stuff. And then when they were asking you more questions, you were probably having more conversations with them it off was, air. It was in the interview process where they were okay. vetting me that they realized how much information I really did have. Okay. And that was when they were kind of formulating their heads. Okay. Uh, 10 episodes is great, but you know, there's a lot more information. When did you know that Jay Widener believed you? Was there anything particular? <sighs> It was probably after we had been shooting for some time. And uh, often I, I would say things and I would hear, 
you know, Jay's, you know, holy crap, you know, and he'd come in and say, wait, wait, wait. And he would like say, that corresponds with this and this that I've heard from so-and-so like 10 years ago that I never told anyone oh, about. that's cool. You know, and so all these things started happening. And, you know, Jay was like, dude, this guy's either the best actor in the whole world, white world, or, you know, he's telling the truth because right. you know, Jay has studied a lot about body language and all that stuff. Yeah, I guess I should should <laughs> fix that question. Not when did you know Jay Weiner believed yeah. you, but when yeah. did you feel like, I yeah, guess. Jay, people, yeah. Jay is, uh, he's a he's a, uh, a very sharp cookie, you know, so, but he, he knows a lot about body language and all that. And I just, I felt him dissecting me, you know, but, uh, you know, he had a lot writing on it. You yeah. Know, his, his reputation. So he wanted to make darn sure that, you know, I wasn't going to get out there and make a full out. Right. So as you, as they extended that to 50 episodes, then like, how do you, how do you actually make the plans? So do you sit down with David Wilcock and you guys kind of bracket out what the season's yeah. going to look like? Uh, or Interestingly enough, we, um, we shot 25 episodes in one week one time because some of the people there were afraid that I was going to get knocked off. I wanted to get as much of the information in as possible. How did that make you feel? I mean, it, I, I totally understood that they, you know, but, you know, th there were serious threats, you know. During that time period, I had a pistol within three to five feet of me at all times, you know. And it didn't help when, like, people came and started harassing us at our home, you know, from Project Avalon. You know, that's what caused us to have to move. So, yeah, there was a lot of that stuff going on. Uh, but, uh, yeah, you know, they, they, you know, we shot 25 episodes in one week. You know, I'm wearing wow. the same shirt. Yeah. But, no, what would happen is we would sit down and we would, uh, Jay would say, okay, um, I think we would like to talk about some of this kind of stuff. Uh, and then uh, David Wilcock has been doing this for so long. He, he'll, he, he just like this and be like, okay, I know how to do it. And they're like, okay. And then we just sit back and David starts the show. That's awesome. None, none of it ever has been outlined. None of it has ever been laid out on paper beforehand. It's always been uh, some of the updates I'll provide like bullet points about what I'm going to talk about to make okay. sure that I get it all in. You know? Interesting. But uh, no, it's all improv. And David Wilcock is such a good interviewer because when I, I really respect him as a journalist. And He's probably one of the sharpest people out there in the industry. You, he definitely knows his stuff. And I, w I loved watching, like when I first started watching in the beginning when it all was coming out, he would ask questions that I, that was exactly where my brain was going, that yeah. I wanted to ask you. And he just really, I think, helped the conversation along really well. And in the beginning, you could tell that you were shy and you're trying to get kind of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I was for? petrified. <laughs> I was scared. Not just of the cameras, but... Of what was going to happen because of what I was saying. That, that makes sense. I was, you I could was, tell you were trying to get oriented in your surroundings, yeah. but as time passed, you could tell you were definitely starting to get more comfortable with yeah. public speaking. Yeah, that is, yeah, getting used to public speaking, being in front of that black hole that looks like a camera <laughs> was very hard for me. But then I started going through quite a bit of a uh, physical and spiritual metamorphosis as well. That was apparent. You could definitely see yeah. the changes. So, um, okay. So then we have May 7th interview, one hour in, Bill Ryan says, in terms of an argument that an attorney might make in court, let's look at it that way. You could say, look, this person here, whose case we are trying, there is every financial motivation for them to solve their financial problems on behalf of their family and children by taking advantage of an opportunity to go on television to be paid reasonably good money for that and to keep that going for as long as possible by any means possible because which bloody American doesn't feel themselves that they have a duty to provide for their family? We can't criticize that. Here's the motivation for somebody to take advantage of this opportunity that has been presented to them and just pick that bull uh, pick up that ball and run with it as fast as they can because they're getting paid. What is your response? Well, my response is that I do have a family that I have to feed. That if my request to remain anonymous would have uh, been honored, that none of you would even see me today. I would be still working in the IT industry and supporting my family well. Uh, at the time, I was having some major difficulties. I'd gotten hurt on the job. Uh, when I first started, I had to have uh, bilateral bicep and rotator cuff surgery. I had to have surgery on a nerve here because uh, I was putting a server, an 80-pound server, into a server rack by myself, which you're not supposed to do. 
And uh, as I was trying to leverage it up, it started to fall and I went to catch it and it jacked me up really bad. So yes, I was having some financial issues during that time period because workman's comp pays, in Texas anyway, pays like very minuscule, you know, and it was, you know, it, it was really a, a rough time. Now, as far as all of this money I'm supposedly making, uh, uh, because of contract reasons, I can't discuss all of the details, but I make most of my money through blueavians.com. Uh, it's the affiliate program. Uh, anyone that signs up through blueavians.com, I get a dollar a month for them. And people will come in, they will binge watch a month or two and then drop their uh, memberships, but some of them will stay on long term. So that's anywhere between 2,400 and like, I think the most it ever was, was like 3,600 one month. And then it, boom, it dropped right after. Other than that, I just get, I can't say specifically, but hundreds of dollars per episode that I do. And a lot of that money ends up going for expenses for me having to go all the way up to, to Gaia. They pay for some, but a lot they don't. Okay. That money I use, yes, to support my family. This house that we moved into, prior to the house we moved in before was a house we could really afford, around $1,700 a month. Uh, some unpleasantness happened at that location, and uh, some people reached out, very generously paid for us a year in this house. And this house is uh, $2,500 a month. After the first year, it was a two-year lease. We didn't realize that was signed. Um, after the, the year, we were responsible for paying it. And if I'm getting $2,400 a month to $3,000 approximately from uh, the affiliate program, that's enough to pay rent and have just a little bit of money left over. So, yes, I have to find ways to, to, to make... That's, that's not a lot of money. You know, that's, that's not the, the big money that people think that I'm making. Now, you know, uh, I have to make my money at conferences and in, in other ways. So people that want to criticize me um, for finding a way to support my family, I, I really just, it, it, it's, it's an argument that I really can't process. You know, there's a lot of shaming that goes on in this community if you make any money in the process. But most of the people shaming you are making money from what they're doing. Right. right. But they're making a very little bit amount of money, and they perceive that since you're on TV, you're making a lot of money. So that that perception gets... I I think that the follow-up question, though, and the underlying message that I think people are really trying to get at with that question isn't... Because, yes, I agree with that. I think a follow-up, though, is you have a testimony, something happened to you that you have been talking about, right? And you are on a TV show that is a continuous TV show, right? So once you tell your testimony, you the, people say, oh, well, he's just making things up so that the show can continue on. Well, no, they, there was a pro an issue because... Uh, the show was wildly successful. You know, we're talking like a couple hundred thousand people a week watching it. You know, that's way more than CNN. Um, so, you know, we got to the end of my testimony of, of all of the information I had to say. After that, basically, I have updates every once in a while. That's when we really started to interview other people that corroborate the information. And, you know, here... Uh, on, on a lot of the upcoming episodes, they're just going to see David interviewing people without me because I have other projects that I'm working on and uh, they're, we're in talks with Gaia right now about, you know, doing another show to where I go through by myself, just me and the camera and talk about everything that I talked about on Cosmic Disclosure, but in more detail. And uh, we're thinking about, uh, you know, calling it uh, Above Cosmic. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. I think that would be really cool. I remember when you talk, started talking about that because I would be really interested in going through again, because I feel like, uh, you, you know, you got into the public eye, you started talking about this and now it's a little bit more refined, right? You've talked about it a lot more. You can hear what people are interested in and you've mm -hmm. had these conversations back and forth. You've gotten a flood of questions over the last couple of years that now sure. I imagine if you were to go back and readdress your story, you would have it more hammered down. It's sort of like when you teach, right. you're going to, you're going to gain, like I, I was a teacher, you, 
you gain a lot from teaching and you right. can teach it better. So that I would love to watch a show like that. That'd yeah. be really cool. Yeah. It's, uh, hasn't been greenlit. It's just, and I yeah, know. yeah, it's, it's, we're going to, uh, we're talking about shooting a pilot and to see how it goes. It's not anything in stone. So, um, but you know, and, and also we got to match that with next year. We're planning basically a world tour to promote the book mm -hmm. and, uh, hopefully promote, you know, to promote Gaia, uh, Gaia, uh, uh, this month, I believe, uh, now is, uh, publishing their, all of their information in Spanish on Gaia. And next they're going to do Portuguese. So that's going to open up a, a lot of area for touring and, and promoting. So what the information that you just shared, I think is a very important piece and gives uh, transparency into this concept that yes, you have a testimony, you're sharing that testimony, you've shared that testimony. Now you want to go and you want to expand that out by making that testimony available across multiple platforms, be it through a comic book or a TV show right. or touring the world and sharing that testimony. Right. And, and in the process, I've gathered a lot of volunteers that are talented and, and well-placed in the industry. And, um, you know, these people want to work for disclosure. They want to bring this information out. So we're trying to form a situation to where they don't have to work for these other places, they can we, they can work on this full time, mm -hmm. be paid, and be able to support their families, but still working for the cause full time. So uh, you know, there's a lot of criticism going out about you know us commercializing disclosure, but you know, the way things have been done in the last seventy years haven't worked. You know, just talking to the people that have nuts and bolts information, it hasn't gotten us anywhere. You know, it's it's a very important part of the overall message that we need to get to the overall public. So, you know, information like what I'm delivering isn't hurting the secret space program narrative. It's assisting it. It's bringing more interest to it. And that's not only bringing more interest to my story, but to other people's work, the nuts and bolts people that feel like they're being ignored right now. Uh, it's, it's bringing more uh, uh, energy and attention to, to their work as well. So this is something that we should all be working together on to try to get the wider public interested in this subject, as well as making them realize, hey, you know, th there are technologies out there that could change my life and then demand it. That's the only way it's going to come out. Yeah. Great answer. So let's do this. Let's talk about this allegation that this is just a marketing campaign to destroy secret space program research. That's exactly what you were just talking about. You might not even need to answer this because you might have just answered it. Um, let's see. May 25th, an interview with dark journalist and Bill Ryan. Disneyfication of the, I like that word, <laughs> of the secret space program is crucial to the marketing campaign effort to attract millennials and young adults. This is clearly an attempt to co-opt important research subjects and to take investigative research to this black into this black project and replace it with fantasy narratives. With Corey's kids spreading his blue avian talking points and gearing up for the next phase of targeting the key demographic of teens. Wow. So, yes, we are. Uh, this three-year marketing campaign, I have no idea where they came up with. Um, I think they may have, uh, the update that I gave where Tierra said within the next three years, us as a mass consciousness will be making our decision on what type of reality we want to live in. Yes. And that we had that short period to, uh, to be able to obtain uh, the optimal temporal reality. I think he took that and just like he did everything else, he took information and just pushed it together mm -hmm. as hard as he could to make something out of it. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have never had any type of marketing campaign that we've written or talked about and put out. What we have talked about is that all of the vanguard, the older people in the uf ufology, are they've pretty much done almost everything they can do. You know, uh, they're they're only reaching people, you know, 35 to you know 80 years old. They're they're, they're not interesting to the younger generation. So the younger generation is not getting this information as readily. So what you have to do, I mean, the younger generation is an entertaining generation. Older generation, they're just, just show me the information. Right. 
you know, I'll just look at the information, that's all I need. Younger generation, you know, they've got short attention spans, you get to get the information to them in an entertaining way. So yes, we decided that millennials need to be inspired and empowered to work in this industry. And from everything that I've seen, all of the uh, older people that have been in it for a while are very happy to see people like you and Jordan and the younger people coming in with enthusiasm. Yeah. So I, I, I really don't get the criticism. Well, and there's also a bunch of movies that I've seen and TV shows and things like that where it says it's based on a true story or a true narrative. And if you're really interested in the movie or the TV show, you watch it and then you see that and you want to go back and you want to research that. Yeah. So if you know, you have this TV show or this comic book and it says based on the testimony by Corey Good, and people are like, wow, this is a really good piece. This is interesting material. They're going to go back and they're going to research more. And now what are they learning about? They're learning about the secret space program and these technologies. Right. So my that's sense. the intent. So, okay. Yeah. And it, you know, the whole concept of discrediting the secret space program or the, the real research into it, um, that just really doesn't make sense to me either yeah. because yeah. it's expanding it's, the content. Yeah. There, there are people that have a certain narrative that they want to promote and anything outside of that narrative, uh, they just have to destroy. And, you know, there's also, you know, there's a, there's a lot going on in the community right now with people trying to be divided or uh, manipulated to where they don't accept certain information. You know, this, this information coming out that's really big about Antarctica has uh, caused a lot of waves. And uh, especially the information about, uh, you know, all the research, uh, illegal research going on, that's what's really freaked out a lot in, uh, in the black op field. So um, the more that I talk about these kinds of things, the harder they're going to come out. And what illegal research? Uh, well, they have R and D labs there. Uh, they have like Lockheed Martin type companies that have, uh, and I've just been told recently that what I have talked about is just the tip of the iceberg. That's why they're freaking out. There's all types of um, <clears throat> biological, chemical uh, research being done down there, but there's also a lot of technical uh, research and development being done. And, um, so, and, the, and there's a major spaceport down there where they they are launching uh, to go up in. Uh, up to space to service these uh, uh, space stations that they have in this, what I've been calling the lower space program. Mm -hmm. that cool. So um, that information is very sensitive to them. Me talking about the stuff that they're planning on coming out anyway, the stuff about the civilization that they found underneath, is not quite, that's not damaging their narrative. But uh, the R&D labs that are down there, they're against the uh, 1959 or whatever treaty for Antarctica, mm -hmm. that's a pretty big deal. What's the biological and chemical research? Do you know anything about uh, that? Yeah, they're doing all different types of cloning, uh, uh, biological weapons. Everything that is completely illegal to do is being done down in Antarctica. It's a zone that's completely controlled. Yeah, only the military can fly over. Uh, we, what, in our conversation earlier, we just have to kind of imagine what's going on there or rely on reports of scientists. So now I wanted to ask you a question about cults. So the dark journalist in a May 25th interview about seven minutes in, this is a quote. Now the participants in the Corybit strategy are just young people trying to get involved in something meaningful. They have no idea they are pawns in the three year entertainment game that is meant to harvest the UFO and SSP community financially, emotionally, and even spiritually. At the Contact in the Desert event, strange banners started popping up claiming the next three years as the opportunity to navigate to the most optimal timeline, drawing on Good's theme of raising our consciousness so we will get to UFO disclosure. This attempt to co-opt spiritual living memes sets the trap for the seeker to agree with Good on these top topics and ignore or go on faith with Good's far-flung stories of being a galactic messenger of the blue avian aliens. This technique is also employed by cult leaders to establish rapport and gain trust. So just a really quick thing, Dark Journalist is a YouTuber who has made some videos 
asking, uh, well, not asking at all, <laughs> making video. He's made some videos, making some allegations against Corey Good and what he has been doing and claiming. Yeah, so, not based on any research, just hearsay and his own animosity towards me. I would like to see what research he did. Yeah, we would if love any, to yeah, see the, any type of research that you have done. That'd be awesome. So anyway, uh, what's your response to the claim that you're trying to gain trust from the millennial masses to move in as a leader of the blue avian cult? Yeah, I would really like someone to point out what type of activities I've done to create a cult. Every single thing I've done, uh, the whole blue avian message ha has been... We don't need any new religions. Everyone's religion has all of these tenets in it. You know, do unto others as you'll have them do unto you. That's service to up, being service to others. This is not developing a cult meme. A cult tells everyone, I am the, the way and the truth. Only through me can you make it to your ascension or to heaven. And that has not been a part of my narrative from the beginning. My narrative has been that everyone has to use their discernment. Everyone has to go through their own spiritual growth process. We have to deal with our karma. We have to, um, you know, forgive others, which is very hard. But forgiving ourselves for certain things, that's the hardest. Now, these are the tenets of many religions, especially Eastern religions. We are, we are not calling anyone under any one banner or flag. We are calling them to stand up in their own truth, in their own power, to get off of their knees to these elite and stand in their own power. Because, you know, we're, we're slaves. So any type of uh, information that I've put out about becoming service to other, others, becoming more loving, um, it is not drawing anyone towards any one cult or ideology it's allowing them to use their already established ideologies and belief systems, focus on those positive things, and expand upon them. So what I've researched recently in regard to all of these allegations coming out from the dark journalists and some from Bill Ryan as well, they talk mainly about the marketing for the new material that you're going to be developing. Right. So I think that it has more to do with questioning the... Um, getting the millennials involved, like, I guess maybe speak to the business decision right. to go into yeah. comic they, books and TV shows. You know, trying to call, you know, they're splitting hairs there, you know. Are, are we doing the great sin of uh, trying to commercialize uh, some of this information to get it to the masses, to uh, help the, uh, the population understand that there are hidden technologies? Are we doing that? Or is there something more sinister occurring? You know, you know a tree by its fruits. And the fruits of our labor have been nothing but teaching people to be more service to others, overcoming their own traumas so they can move on spiritually. You know, um, a lot of these nuts and bolts people have problems with the whole ascension message. They believe that it's just a false narrative to give people false hope, just like every other religion. So, you know, it's, it's really hard for me to, to figure out how they see this as being some sort of a cult. Um, now, you know, the business part, yes, we are, you know, we are market, a business markets to a certain demographic. And we're a uh, comic book, that demographic is usually people between, I think it's in their mid-20s and, believe it or not, their 50s. Most of the people that buy comic books are in their late 40s and 50s. Are you the only person? Are you the only person in this, I guess, industry that would that has ever decided to do a comic book with related with relation to topics like the Secret Space Program? No, you know, interestingly enough, um, I think the publisher was Hidden Hand or something strange like that. Um, a uh, comic book was uh, done and agreed to by Bill Ryan, who's attacking me for doing a comic book on Serpo. Um, something that uh, is one of many different uh, stories that have come across, you know, Bill's uh, desk that he put out there as truth and then went against and then, you know, it's him and hauled on. But, uh, yeah, that the Project Serpo was turned into a graphic novel and uh, uh, Bill Ryan even wrote the forward to that graphic, graphic novel. 
in your opinion, what is the value of a project like that or any project like a comic book? Well, Roger and I have talked about uh, comic books were first developed as propaganda during like World War II time period. That's what they're really developed out. Um, you know, they are covertly using these types of tools to affect the mass consciousness of people. Uh, what we're wanting to do is overtly use these tools against, use the negative tools against them. Uh, you know, like money. Money is a, a negative thing, but you have to have money to continue on a mission. Yeah, it's a, the same goes with, with, with that topic. Okay. So let's talk about a couple of what I'm calling elephants in the room. <clears throat> Because as I was doing this research, I had some two really big things come up. So let's talk about the concept of you being blacklisted. This is talked about a lot. Oh, from so, the IT industry? From the IT industry, yeah. yeah. So you mentioned losing your job over your name being publicized. And can you tell us a little bit about how that prevented you from going, you know, staying, remaining that industry in right. that industry and then how that to this day still affects you? If Absolutely. Well... Um, even more now that I have done a show, it's even more out there, but um, there's a process you go through when you hire on with any uh, major firm to do IT work. They, they do a background search, a social media search, and a Google search on you. If you ping as being a person that talks with aliens, says they've been to outer space, or talks to eight foot tall blue birds, they are not letting you anywhere near their billion dollar data. They're just not. Um, true, I could go back and get a job doing like help desk work, making like, you know, 16, 18 bucks an hour, like how I first started over 20 years ago. But, uh, you know, that, that's going to put me working, you know, again, like 45, 50 hours a week and have no time to uh, get this information out. Gotcha. So even working like freelance, you're just thinking wouldn't be... No, and that's what I did a lot. You know, people, you know, uh, talk a lot about, you know, Corey did, didn't, was not in the IT field. Uh, then Dr. Sala did some actual journal, journalism and found, showed that I what, did work in the IT field. And then they're picking at other things. You know, I, I worked in the IT field for 20 years. And at the end of 20 years, just about everyone, if they have the certifications and the experience, which you do after 20 years, you start making in the six-figure range. So a long time ago when I was, I, I did a lot of contracting and I would, uh, one time I re, uh, accidentally, instead of my check, I received the bill that they were sending to where I was working, the, the contracting firm. And I saw they were paying me, I think at the time I was getting paid like $32 an hour, but they were charging like 80 bucks an hour for me. So I figured, why not cut out the middleman? So I started doing contract work and I would charge anywhere from 65, 90 to even 120 bucks an hour sometimes. I had other people in the industry that did different things because I specialized. I didn't have a wide super range, you know, I didn't know Linux and I didn't know all these other things, but I pooled with other professionals and we worked together. So, you know, I, I did have a lucrative uh, um, career in the IT field. It would be even stronger right now if I was still in because I was at the point where I was really, you know, starting to make good money and being able to provide for my family. And you have a bachelor's degree in religion and... I did not finish. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah I was a religion uh, major psychology minor at Southern Nazarene University. I was actually going into the ministry, uh, trying to follow my grandfather's footsteps. So... You know, um, I left my third year there, met Stacy, and we left school. I became kind of disillusioned. Um, I was in class a lot of the times. Uh, the professor would be talking, and the kids were sitting there writing it down, and I'd be like, wait a minute. And I'd raise my hand, and I'd ask a question that would embarrass him because he would have to explain it, and a lot of times he couldn't explain, you know, different things about religion and, and how it's applied in the church and all that. Finally, the Doctrine of Holiness professor and another professor pulled me into their office and uh, they said, do you see those two books? And I looked up and it was a Nazarene handbook and the Holy Bible. And they said, do you or do you not believe that through, only through those two books can you get to heaven? And I said, absolutely not. And they told me, 
you know, um, you are not cut out to, you know, be a Nazarene minister, you know, we're dropping you from the uh, uh, religion major group, you know, you can find another major. So after that, I was pretty disillusioned and, uh, you know, we uh, moved to Dallas, got married, and um, I, we went to church, you know, fairly often up until, you know, a couple years ago. And how did you get into IT after that? Yeah, uh, after, after, I didn't know what I was going to do after I left school. And um, I didn't even know how to type. I had uh, one of our roommates uh, had one of these old box Macintoshes. They had a typing program that taught you how to type. So um, I learned how to type off of that. And I didn't know anything about computers. So one of our good friends came over, uh, took a computer apart, told me all about it, had, helped me put it back together, and started teaching me from the ground up. And then uh, I studied, went and got my A-plus certification, which is an industry standard certification, for mainly hardware. Um, I received that certification, and I, and I was working at Stream International doing help desk stuff. I like didn't know anything about computers. So I went through that whole process of, uh, you know, I, I self-taught myself, got my uh, MCSE, Microsoft Certified Systems Engineer certification, and uh, I got that certification. Everyone that had that certification was making big bucks, and I got the certification right when they started outsourcing all of our jobs to India. You know, so uh, people see me. I was in an article to where I, I was protesting my job being sent to India. That's, that's out there. People brought that up as well. Okay. But uh, yeah, I worked my way up after, uh, through uh, 20 years uh, doing a lot of contracting, going like three months here, six months there, doing uh, you know jobs. And that exposed me to a lot of different environments and a lot of different uh, technologies uh, within uh, uh, Microsoft networking. Okay. Uh, and and uh, Citrix and VMware. Okay, great. So I worked for a company that was created by Citrix, actually. Oh, yeah, which one? Appfolio. Oh, okay, I'm not familiar with it. Uh, it's an accounting software. Oh, okay. Like ADP kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay, so elephant in the room number two. You ready for it? <clears throat> this, is, this is what I was thinking. This is just my thoughts. So you were outed into the public eye. And then criticized for going into the public eye with your story. By the same people. So, what's up with that? That doesn't make sense. There, there's so much hypocrisy in all of these attacks, you know, like with the comic book, you know. I mean, the hypocrisy, if we lined it all up, would be, you know, pretty amazing. You know, I've been, you know, most of these people are accusing me of stuff that they're allegedly doing, which is human nature. How did that make you feel, though, when that started to come out about you being criticized for being in the public eye by the same people that outed you? Like, how did that? It, well, those people—they're they're, those people are such a noisy. They're just a noisy minority of the most of most of the people out there that are listening to this information. So I, I treated it that way. You know, David Wilcock gave me the uh, advice to you know ignore it, ignore it. Uh, in 2015, there were these huge forum wars to where uh, Bill Ryan's first attempt to come out, and um, I think his ex-wife told me he's obsessed with you and he's going to destroy you if it's the last thing he does or something like that. Um, that was like two years ago. Huh. So, um, yeah, there, that, there was that big 2015 attempt to discredit me and bring me down, and uh, this is just the latest one. And, and every single person that has uh, attacked me just about every single one of them have a membership on Project Avalon. We could do a nice little chart. Uh, any of the others are people that Project Avalon members have gaslit to uh, get upset and jump on the bandwagon. It all, all roads lead back to Bill Ryan and Project Avalon, which he's been using as a group to gain stock me for some time but especially over the last month or so. Um, him and the dark journalists and a few others have coordinated. It's a huge coordinated attack. Uh, they try to say it's not coordinated, it's an organic movement to, for truth, you know. Right. But uh, uh, I've seen emails, all types of collusion going on about how they're going to assassinate my brand. 
how they're going to destroy any business uh, I have. Um, they were real triggered about the ancient aliens appearance. They said, uh, you know, some of these emails where people were talking about uh, they wanted it after people see him on ancient aliens and they Google him, uh, you know, they want to put out information to where bad information pops up. Mm -hmm. So there, was, there were all these plans. And I, I was hearing a lot of this before Contact in the Desert. So that's why I was so paranoid. Yeah. I was incredibly paranoid at Contact in the Desert. I didn't know. And we had people that we thought were somewhat close to us that were turning on us. So then it makes you a little leery of the people that you already have concerns about. Well, and it's interesting too, seeing, because this is all sort of, some of this stuff is very new to me with the, I mean, with the Corey's Kids thing that was created by the dark journalist and he would never say any of our names without first saying Corey's kid, Teresa Yanaris. And so it was, it was this hitting you over the head with the same thing, repetition so that it would catch. Right. And people, it's funny now because That's what people, the Nazis would do, it's the big <laughs> lie theory. You repeat a big lie enough and only that big lie, then the masses start to believe it. And people think now, some people actually think we created that term. They're saying, oh, you're, you're part of Corey's kids crew. I'm like, no, 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 no. We didn't create that no, term. That, a, <laughs> that is not our term. Yeah. It was invented by this uh, person, uh, the dark journalist right. who has a marketing background. He accuses us of being a uh, uh, cult, trying to bring a cult together, but he's like had articles in his magazine about cult marketing uh, cult specifically. Mar yeah. Yeah. You know, so it's, uh, it's very obvious uh, to most of us, you know, what he's been doing, you know, he, uh, you know, gets on the camera and you know, talks all snidely, and, you know, it's, it's just a very weird energy. And that's something I've been noticing is that people with these high energy uh, influxes and changes, what I've been saying all along, the good are becoming better, the bad are becoming worse, and the crazier are becoming crazier. It's really happening. We're seeing it before our eyes. And um, a lot of people that... Uh, deal with a lot of traumas or have a lot of negative polarity issues they're dealing with, they're being pulled in that direction by these energies. They're revealing, everyone's revealing themselves. They're being pulled over to, you know, places like Project Avalon. Um, people that are service to others and really wanting to um, make this reality a better place for all of us um, are gravitating towards the positive message and trying to be service to others and help people instead of tearing them down. There's this whole concept that you, know, you have creators and then you have destroyers and you can be focused on creating goodness and putting good, good content and uh, a good message out into the world and you're aligning yourself with energies that are going to help you do that even right. more, and then, or you can align yourself with destruction, and inst and it's, to me, it seems sort of like a waste of good energy, where it's like you, you know, you have a soul contract, you're here for a reason, and is that reason really to just to you know like the energies with associated with the destruction of other people's creations, just sitting there saying, oh, well, this creation's a bad creation or just being criti yeah. critiquing and it and it's and it's really all out of either jealousy or people their their truth we've been hearing that so people you know telling these complete lies and fabrications and saying i'm telling you my truth you know something that's interesting too is that it's like you haven't even had a chance to put these projects out into the world yet like you announced these projects yeah, and then it was just like take this yeah. and it's like can we just, uh, my first initial who, reaction... Who knows if they will fail or even work? Yeah. You'll give it a chance to yeah. sink or swim. Yeah. yeah, that was my very first thought. I'm thinking, well, wow, that's kind of crazy to me because you haven't even had a chance to publish the book, to get the comic book out there, to get you know, any of this stuff. It's, it's all brand new. You announce and you're excited about it. Right. And instead of people saying, okay, well, even if they're against you or don't agree with you or believe your story, they could just say, okay, well, and then move on with their projects or whatever they're doing to, right. to create and add into this collective instead of spending all their time. And that's what makes me think that it is a, a coordinated attack. Oh, it is. Yeah. Well, you know, and there are a lot of people that are, they've rationalized a lot of really dark behavior. Um, a lot of people in the light community that... There's a few that have been spreading vicious, horrible lies and rumors about Stacey and I, uh, our personal life, that there's a, it's really, uh, you know, it's upset my wife, my daughter, and me. It's just really bad. But these people are, call themselves light workers. <clears throat> so light, some of these people that call themselves light workers are rationalizing a lot of dark behavior. 
I've also talked to some of the people that are rationalizing, that call themselves truthers, but are rationalizing telling lies about me. And when I ask them, you know, how is it that you can knowingly go out and spread disinfo about me and call this some sort of fight for the truth? And some of them have actually told me that it is authorized because since they believe I'm a liar and since they believe that my information is hurting people, then therefore they are authorized to use the same methods against me. Therefore, since they believe I'm a liar, they are authorized as truthers to lie about me, to discredit me, so that their truth can rise to the top. That's what uh, this has actually been for conversations. How is your test? How could your testimony harm people? I I really don't know. I mean, um, there. Are, you know, I guess becoming more service to others is, you know, pretty scary to, to some people. But, um, you know, I mean, there there are people, you know, in this community, there are a lot of people who don't want to talk about it. There are more than you find out in public. A large number of people that have uh, not just personality distortions, but mental issues. So, you know, that's, gonna, that's a part of the equation as well. You know, there's all, and especially if these big major energy changes, they're, um, they're being triggered by these energies and they're acting out and their strange behavior is becoming more evident. Like, I, when I think about that, the concept of your testimony harming the industry or something, I, I can see from their perspective, some people's perspective where it's like, okay, this concept of a blue avian alien might make some people that don't know anything about the secret space program go, oh, well, that's obviously none of that's true because that's just so wild or whatever. But I see it more like separated where you have research that can be corroborated that other people are also talking about. And then you have things that are a little bit out there. I mean, the whole, it's, it's all a out, lot there. out there. Yeah. yeah. And then that can't be corroborated where it's just like, okay, but you just got to hold that over here and gain more data. You still haven't, you know, don't make up your mind on it yet. And and all of this, though, I have to say, in support of you, you're releasing it in the entertainment industry. Right. So with that being said, anyone that's going to go and they're look, they're watching a TV show that's presented as I don't know. I, I mean, this is all speculation because the TV show doesn't even exist. But if it's presented as science fiction, then people are going to enjoy that for it being science fiction. And then it's based on a true story. They can go and they can right. look at the information. So it's not that you're releasing a, a movie saying this is all 100 million percent true. Although that is what you say about your testimony, you know, but you're going into the entertainment industry with it. Right. So there's that level of people are going to watch it because it's enjoyable. It's right. entertaining. You have to make it entertaining and enjoyable for it to be successful. And, uh, you know, Cosmic Disclosure has been very successful, and it was just two guys sitting with a fake brick wall behind them, talking in a, like a sort of like a briefing. Mm -hmm. Very simple, you know. But uh, it's it's entertaining. I know uh, it, there are a good number of people that watch the show that don't believe a word of it, but the information's getting into their subconscious. Uh, I've had people come up to me at conferences and say, "I don't believe a word you're saying." But it is the most interesting stuff I've ever seen, or, or you know, or whatever. And that doesn't hurt my feelings. Uh, it's just like you know, there are people been out there that have you know poo pooed me or got on the poo poo quarry train <laughs> that uh, have said some things, and I don't have any animosity. I'll work with those people tomorrow. It's, it it hasn't uh, affected me, you know. But, uh, you know, I, it, these deep attacks that are rooted, that all go back really to, to Bill Ryan and Avalon, um, you know, the, the, that's an annoyance that I would like to see go away. But from what I hear, uh, he'll, he, he's going to be cursing me in his dying breath. You know, he, he, I'm told that he blames me f uh, also for uh, his marriage ending, you know. Which uh, is, is very unfortunate. I, it was during the time uh, that all of the unpleasantness was happening um, when I first came out. Um, he was, um, Christine was telling me, uh, he's trying to trigger you, he's trying to trigger you, he's manipulating you, he's trying to make you blow up and look bad in public. Uh, he's obsessed with you, you know. And then it was weeks later, you know, she uh, 
contacts me and she's, you know, freaking out that she said she had to vacate the house because, uh, you know, he, he threatened to kill her because he was so triggered over all of this. So, and she wasn't really, I don't know what was going on, but she was trying to ground him and say, you know, Corey's not that bad or something like that. And that's when, you know, tripped out, you know, flipped out on her. And apparently it scared her so badly that the next time he went into town, she packed up and I guess took half the gold out of the uh, safe, according to uh, uh, Bill, and uh, left because I mean, she was scared. So, you know, there was a, uh, and, you know, for, for some reason, you know, I guess he was triggered because of me when that happened. That, that's just what I've been told by some people from Avalon that have contacted me quietly is that, you know, he has a lot of animosity towards me about that as well. Well, it sounds like in the last couple of years, there have been a lot of things that have happened um, around you and to you and involving you that have been some good, some bad. And I'm hoping that this interview now can be some energetic closure for you for some of the things that have happened in the past, mm -hmm. helping give new energy and light into the projects that you're actively working on now so right. that we can get some space in between and get some positive uh, mm -hmm. creation out oh, there yeah. uh, and get mm -hmm. some of those new energies flowing. So. Yeah. Yeah. All of this is, you know, uh, it's affected things. A lot of people, like I said, had a knee jerk reaction to that Satanism uh, baloney that they put out um, and withdrew. Uh, including some team members. Uh, some of them withdrew just because of all the negativity around. So, and us dealing with the negativity, it's knocked off about a month of our creativity and productivity. You know, we're, we're really behind on a lot of things. So this is going to be my last word on it. And then we're just moving on and we're ignoring that small, uh, noisy minority that are bringing up all of these lies. I think, people are gonna see them for what they are. Anyone that spent time with us at these conferences or retreats, they know that it is absolutely wrong. Mm -hmm. Yes, all right, let's get through this. So now we're gonna talk about how you got into this and how you are supported. So the allegations are you are a pathological liar, you're a government plant, and you built your testimony off of other people's stories. So. Uh, let's see. May 29th interview with dark journalist and Bill Ryan, a minute and 29 in. Uh, Bill Ryan says that you're a pathological liar. There are others who claim to have gone to high school with you that say you're a pathological liar in high school. And I wanted to give you an opportunity yes. to respond to this. Claim. That's the same, this same person that claims to have gone to high school with me that, uh, Bill keeps bringing up, um, did not go to my high school. They first approached me saying, I went to high school with you. And they had the wrong state or the wrong city, the wrong state, the wrong school, nothing was right. And I've challenged that person, show me a yearbook with your photo in it and your name in it and my face being in the same yearbook and we'll talk. And they digress every time. None of their information matches. And um, yeah, they're spreading around that uh, I was a bully and all this, but I was a head shorter than everyone. I would, I got, uh, I was kicked out of junior highs and high schools and it was for fighting. Um, and my nickname was kicking ass Corey because I was this little scrawny guy about a head shorter than everyone else. And the bullies would come and try to mess with me. And I grew up in such obviously a crazy environment and, and had training that, uh, I wouldn't do the back and forth bully stuff. Was, if I saw I was about to get my butt kicked by a bully, I would strike first and, you know, was usually justified. Um, but this person, uh, this lady, I think it's Nikki, I can't remember, uh, that's claiming that they went to high school with me. It's, it's a total fabrication. Um, it's uh, something that uh, this person said that they've been in contact with a dark journalist and told them everything. And I was like, okay. You went to the person telling lies about me and gave them more lies. You know, so what? Okay. Stupid. Okay, yeah. let's see. Uh... Uh, well, <laughs> this, this person uh, also seems to pop up. There's this another lady that contacts me all the time saying that I'm her real son that was uh, kidnapped from her uh, when, uh, when uh, I was an infant. And she's convinced of it. And she has her family convinced of it. And I've received emails from them. So there's a whole lot of weird stuff like that that happens. Oh, okay. So 
I wouldn't doubt if they contact uh, dark journalist next and he'll be Corey's real mom. The goes on record. <laughs> <laughs> whistleblower of truth. Yeah. Corey's real mom. <clears throat> truth in 2017. Is that what? Oh, I don't know. Uh, That's funny. Okay. Go for truth. Uh, <laughs> Bill Ryan in an interview on May 7th with dark journalist says that one of the project Avalon IT administrators, I don't know if I'm going to pronounce this name correct. If it's even a real name. Illy Pandia, after having firsthand experience of your claimed IT experience, said something does not add up. He is not an IT expert. Can you tell us why he might have said that, what he was referring to, and can you tell us about your interaction with him? I know you've already provided documentation yeah. online yeah. that has proved your certifications, but I'm more so interested in understanding about I've, the interaction. I've, with never, I've never known what exchange they're talking about. Oh, okay. It was just something... Um, I guess in general conversations I had uh, with people, I don't even remember this, so I'm trying to speculate. Oh, okay. uh, general conversations I had with somebody, people in the IT industry are real catty. Uh, people that do, um, you know, uh, that are all into. Um, it must be the only industry where they're catty. It must be. <laughs> uh, people that are like Unix administrators. Oh, Unix is the best. Everyone that does Microsoft, there is just stupid. They're, you know, it's you know, you know, Microsoft people. Are, uh, you, you know, it's it's that way. And uh, someone that's really versed in Unix would talk to a person that's really versed in uh, you know the Microsoft platform, and you know. They're going to be like, well, this is my way is so much more efficient, and other, and they that's just the way it is. That's the way it's always been for twenty years that I've been in. So that might have something to contribute to it. The person may have just had a beef with me. I don't know where that came from, but for Bill Ryan to assert Corey uh, faked his IT career, it's not real, based on hearsay from someone in his forum. And then going out to the public and spitting it out as though it is a fact that he's verified and researched is irresponsible. It's it's disinformation, pure and simple. Okay, so we'll move on from that. Um, borrowed testimony. So can you speak a little bit about that? Um, Bill Ryan's claim that you borrowed testimony from particularly Michael Relf in the year 2000. There was a yeah. book called... Or an account called the Mars Records? Right. Um, when I first started, and this is very interesting because I think I have this documented as well, uh, conversations I had with uh, Bill Ryan, uh, and I first started sharing my testimony with him, it was like just before I started doing Cosmic Disclosure and all that. Um, he said, have you read this book? And I said, no. So he sent me a PDF of it. And... I started looking through it, and it was all of these uh, Scientology sessions and stuff. I, I would like, read through it, and there would be like some little bits of like uh, I was on Mars or something. I, I it was not coherent for me. I, I looked through it, and I, was, I just tossed it aside. So no, I did not data mine that document for for my information. It was after uh, I had given Bill Ryan my my information that he shared that with me. And of course, I could see his affinity for it since he is majorly into Scientology, and that testimony was gleaned from um, I can't remember the type of what they call the sessions, uh, the Scientology sessions, uh, uh, where they use all these different instruments and techniques to have help you recall memories and stuff. Okay. So let's see. Criticism, the next section is criticism about conduct. So the first uh, one is, why don't you take a test to prove you're telling the truth? We'll break these down in a second. Your family threatened Bill Ryan, leave the more fantastical claims out of your testimony, and your testimony has no journalistic value. So the first one, why don't you take a test to prove you're telling the truth, whether it be a polygraph or do a hypnotic regression? Um, well, as far as the hypnotic regression, um, the regressive work... Uh, could bring about a lot, bring out a lot of the information that uh, the Maya suppressed. Because um, when uh, um, I had a, a, a detached retina, and it took them three surgeries to get it back on. When I went in, uh, the uh, surgeon looked at my eye and he said, "This is," he said, "Your." Uh, retina is like a canned tomato. He said, we, can, we can't hardly get it back together. He says, it's, and other aspects of it, it looks like astronaut's eye. So, you know, uh, 
we, we, you know, they had to do three surgeries to get it attached again. And uh, the trauma of having needles stuck in my eye and all the things, it, it brought all of my memories from all three 20 and backs and uh, different things I was forced to take part in brought all those memories back. And there were a lot of extremely dark memories and I was literally suicidal. It was really bad. And the Mayans came and they suppressed those memories and I, they need to be kept suppressed. Now, as far as a, a lie detector test, when we, uh, we've talked about doing it for the show and a couple things. That's something that we're kicking around. Um, you know, at someone like myself that has been put through so many different testing, uh, I can't even have, the doctor can't check my um, blood pressure without it shooting through the roof. Um, when we were trying to figure out if I had PTSD uh, or some sort of uh, seizure disorder a long time ago, uh, I had to go into a sleep clinic to where they had electrodes on my head and um, they were having problems uh, with getting good readings and all that because I had such a high anxiety, uh, like white coat syndrome of being, uh, you know, approached by people in white coats attaching things to me. So we'll have to do it in an environment where I'm, I am not triggered. That's something we've talked about. Now, it is everyone that has spent time with me throughout this last two years, they understand that I'm not lying. I am telling the truth as I know it, as I believe it to be. There have been, uh, they've done a lot of uh, reverse speech on me, found nothing uh, that was deceptive. Uh, re recently, I can't remember her name, it's a, a really cool channel that does body language. Uh, she did, uh, uh, she had many people asking her, do body language on Corey Good? We want to know if he's telling the truth. She's, she did body language a study on me, and at the end she said, I'm not saying ETs are real, I'm saying this guy believes what he's saying. So, you know, if I took a uh, lie detector test and I pass it, a lot of the people are out there, what they're going to do is they're just going to say, he may have had a tack in his shoe. He uh, is a trained operative. Trained operatives spend time hooked up to those machines learning how to deceive them. You know, that, that's the next round that's going to come out. So you're basically saying, like, why bother waste the energy going down that path when I have better things to do with my time? Right, right. Yeah, and, you know, I think there's enough information out there where people can decide whether, you know, I'm uh, being a pathological liar or if I'm telling something that I really believe. Now, whether you believe I'm mind-controlled, uh, these memories are implanted, whatever you believe. You need to kind of change your theory a little bit from me being an active liar to telling something that I really believe to be true. And then decide whether or not the information I believe to be true is true for yourself. So you're, you're basically saying really the weight would lie more on me being mind controlled than it would be on me lying because so many people have already said like yeah. that you're not lying based on reverse speech and the body language and that kind of stuff. Right. Um, as far as the minds coming to suppress your memories, when exactly did that happen again? That was in 2016? That was before I was even on Cosmic Disclosure. Okay. Yeah, I was, uh, <clears throat> I, I got injured on the job and I'd had a detached retina right around the same time period <clears throat> and ended up losing my job. We had to uh, move out of the apartment we were in, we were about to be evicted. So we moved into my parents' house for a couple of years while I was going through all of the uh, you know, recovery, or some of the recovery. So, you know, uh, you know, living with, you know, we had lived with my parents for a while, and that was, actually, it was at my mom's, and my mom and stepdad's house. Um, I was in the living room, they were appearing, it was the first time I met Gonzalez, I didn't know who he was, he didn't know who I was, it, you know, uh, he was just instructing me what was going on. And that's when, uh, in your interview with Stacy, she talked about she came out of the back room, walked in, and was like, what is this? I'm not seeing this. This isn't happening. Yeah, I was yet. just about to mention that. If you want to hear Stacy's perspective on that, you can check out her video on my channel as well. So, interesting. So that's when they came and they suppressed those painful memories that you had, and yes. you're not ready. You don't want to walk down that again. That's why no, you want to do the regression. No, it was, okay. very, it was a very dark time. You know, I, a lot of people in, that have been in these programs a lot of the reason they don't want to talk is because they don't want to self-incriminate themselves. They have been forced to do a lot of really dark things. 
you know, uh, forced, they will either kill you or your family or, you know, any number of things. So, yeah, there are things that uh, I was forced to be involved with that uh, I'm still trying to forgive myself for and trying to process. So, you know, this is something that I have to handle uh, carefully. In a natural way. Okay. Um, threats toward Bill Ryan. Apparently, okay. On May 13th, 15 minutes into an interview with dark journalist and Bill Ryan, Stacey Good was upset with Bill Ryan over a small grievance, which he never even discusses what that grievance was, and I couldn't find anything online yeah, discussing was, the it, grievance. The, the grievance, for the record, was it was over the entity attachment and uses Jesus, using Jesus' name thing. That's where the, the disagreement happened. And then it, the disagreement happened because of his Scientology beliefs against my Christian beliefs, Stacy has the same Christian beliefs. He started coming out real hard on me in the forum about the Christian beliefs and about how, you know, this is the way entity attachments work and all that. We disagreed. Stacy mentioned that it, uh, or talked about it was his Scientology belief system. Um, even though he practices something called free form Scientology, he insists, I am not a Scientologist. I am not a Scientologist. But that's like, you know, you were Catholic, I was Protestant, but we're both Christian, right? You know, it's splitting hairs and semantics. So that's where the big, like, kind of that big battle happened, and that's what he's referring to. Wasn't there the also, the like, an interview that you had done where you had talked about that and he wanted to take that information yes. out of the interview? Yes. So there was there were two things. He wanted to take that information out of the interview that you were potentially going to go public with, not the, the with second your interview, The second interview okay. I did with Christine Anderson. Okay. That's when I talked about uh, using the name of Jesus to, to get rid of the entity attachments. Okay. And uh, he went through the roof on that. He was he, did, he was not going to put that on his channel. Was that the first time that you guys disagreed on something? Was that kind of the... Yes. That's where everything... That's when everything went south. And okay. if you look at his history, uh, we can put a list up of all of these people, Atticus and all these people through Project Avalon, to where he's come out and said, this person's a real deal. This is really good information. And then he has some sort of just minor personality kind of conflict with, and then he comes out against him with both barrels. You know, and it's, uh, if we look back at the records of uh, what Carrie Cassidy said about why they broke up, uh, there were two of their whistleblowers that he started coming out against and was calling frauds when they, she says they weren't. But he got triggered somehow against them. So anyone that he disagrees with or is triggered against, he has to destroy. Okay. So, no journalistic value. So he says in an inter the same interview, one hour in, this work he's getting into with Good doesn't have any academic or journalistic value and really looks more like a circus with the comis bo comic books and everything else. So what's your response to the claim that your work has no journalistic value? Well, what is, we were talking about this earlier, what is journalism? Well, it's basically bringing news out. So right. reporting on news. Right. So uh, a person coming forward giving a lot of information about a secret space program, uh, hidden technologies, uh, the need for us to grow spiritually, which every ET experience that people have reported, what are the two things they say? Release suppressed technologies and then grow spiritually or become more, you know, spiritual. Those are, those are the two things that the, all the aliens that have contacted us are asking us to do. That's what we're trying to do. And as far as the comic books, I mean, we already mentioned. Right. You know, he, We've kind of beat that. Yeah. That horse. That's just, <laughs> just ridiculous. So let's talk a little bit about the Linda Moldenhow uh, situation. Right. So um, after claiming that, she, so you came out during Contact in the Desert, you said that she was a name on the project, and then she. Right. Well, what had happened is um, the night before, up until like one, we were doing the slides. And uh, we were talking about how Linda Moulton Howe, we were discussing with her writing the forward, and she was very excited about partaking in it. And, um, you know, uh, somehow it ended up on the slide, Linda Moulton Howe, and uh, Dr. Sala's name was left off. And that, it was kind of embarrassing that that slide popped up. But in the announcement, and when the video comes out on the internet, people will see, I'm talking about people involved, not being authors. And I say, I see Linda Moulton's Howe on the slide, and I'm, I'm surprised, and I said, oh, and Linda Moulton Howe yeah. might be involved. 
Okay. That's what I said. And then they, people took photos of the slide and uh, sent them into the dark journalist. Oh, okay. The dark journalist basically gaslit Linda Moulton Howe. He contacted her, said, these people are Satanists. Uh, they're saying that they're working with you. They say that you're writing a book. No, she's like, no, I'm not writing a book. Well, they're saying you're writing a book. You know, just totally manipulated and gaslit her. And uh, she's a strong Christian, kind of like I am. And when she saw all of the, um, the, the video that he made calling uh, Roger a Satanist, she just had like a knee-jerk reaction and, and pulled out and didn't pull out in a very graceful way, sadly. So let's talk a little bit about Roger Richards, mm -hmm. who's one of your business associates. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit how, about how you met him and how you guys started working together? Yes. Uh, originally, when we started the Full Disclosure Project about a year ago, he wrote in and said he wanted to help. Um, he also had sent in, um, I wanted to do a bunch of uh, banner, uh, or roadside advertising to where, you know, it talked about there was, there's suppressed technologies that could, that could save your life and stuff like that to kind of promote out that, you know, advanced technologies exist and the normal person can see it and think about it. And uh, he sent in some really cool ideas. Uh, on uh, billboards and he was writing in as Emma Gold and in my mind it was a girl I thought it was a girl and I he had has a, a really interesting business to where um, he's helping a, his business is, is awesome he's a cottage industry business that um, like people in India that do crafts and that's a dying art he found a way to find people in the West that want to buy these things so this, it keeps the art alive and it allows people to um, <clears throat> be able to uh, survive financially while selling their arts and crafts to boutiques. And he's done a lot of work with, uh, uh, you know, the child slave labor and uh, women's rights. He's heavily into that. Uh, he's got a documentary that's about to come out back when I was a religion major. Uh, I worked a little bit with a guy that was in something called Probe Ministries. They investigated cults. So I actually sat there next to other religion majors and we interviewed real Satanists and talked to real Satanists to get information about it, to know how to counsel them later on. So I know the energy, the look. I know every, I know a real Satanist when I see one. And uh, the, there's every bit of the energy that comes from him is is very loving and caring and that character, characterization was based off of a tattoo. It's so interesting that you that synchronicity between where you were going to follow in your grandfather's footsteps, and then now here you are, and you have this Blue Avian message, and it's like you're really working toward spiritual truth. And yeah, yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, you know, Roger, Roger's a really good guy. And when all this came out, uh, it really hurt him deeply. You know, he even offered... Uh, to resign and, and all of these things. And I said, no way. You know, I mean, um, when he, he was just a, a username until I met him at Mount Shasta in uh, 2016. Okay. That's the first time I met him. And we hit it off great. I told him I wanted to do a vlog. He uh, said he would help me edit it because I don't know the first thing about editing stuff. You know, he's going to teach me that as well. And he started editing my vlog and I was talking to him about uh, this uh, uh, graphic novel idea that really uh, one of the other people on my team, Cam, really came up with the idea about, you know, that it would be a, a good way to get the information out. And then I brought that to him and he's a doer and he, he got to work putting teams together and, uh, you know, the rest is history. We've been, we work well together. We're a very good team. So I can see why certain people would want to split us up. But, you know, a lot of the stuff, almost all of it that's out there being said, some of the recent testimony about his business practices, um, they're, they're, they're not telling the truth. Uh, we've got the emails as well on it. We've showed, showed them to uh, Justin and a few people. And it doesn't match up with the claims that are being made from people uh, that are going on the dark journalists who happen to be members of Project Avalon. Mm -hmm that are spreading these lines. Well, I work with you and Roger, and I love working with both of you guys. So, And I already went on the record and talked about how professional it was. So, uh, And that, my friends, oh, 
One last allegation, and then we get to the fun stuff, the viewer questions. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the occult symbolism drama with the hand signal and the blue avian? The blue avians. Boy, they did an interesting job of putting uh, Baphomet next to uh, the blue avian and trying to say that it was a Luciferian or, or a satanic image. And if they had spent, once again, done any journalistic research, if they would have gone on, gone online and not just said, I want this to be Satanist, boom, 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 look up Baphomet, put the blue avian next to it. Well, if they would have done what we're going to do right now, go online, look up hand signs and art and, and all of this, they're going to see the same hand sign used over and over and over in art of Jesus. The blue avian message uh, of being service to others is very much like do unto others as you would have done unto yourself. This is a very Christian-like message. So uh, in a marketing way, they were trying to tie it to Satanism to give people that are love and light type people to make them have that visceral reaction, and it worked. You know, uh, they have a lot of experience in marketing, so they knew how to put that together in a way that would manipulate minds. Who created that drawing? Of, oh, the blue alien? The yeah. blue avian? Yes. That was um, uh, Android Jones, and he did that in 2015 at Gaia, when we were uh, all sitting in a boardroom. I had, they had the animation of it actually being drawn that we can that we can show as well whose decision was it to put the hand signal in the drawing well it was as i was describing to him how they would hold their hand up and do these different hand signals mm -hmm. and put their lips like this mm -hmm. as they were uh, connecting to us mm -hmm. uh, that i'm going to hand my help held my hand up i was doing that and so he incorporated it into the, the drawing. So you've actually seen the blue avians hold up their hand like that? Yes. Did you ask them, or do you know why they would particularly make that hand signal? It's not just that is one of the hand signals. Uh, they, it, it is an interesting way they will communicate. They'll sit there, and it's as if they're trying to talk because their, uh, their mouth is doing kind of like that. But they're, with one hand, they'll be doing like motions and hand signals. Maybe they're half Italian, I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> you know, they use, like, they use a hand, hand signals, and that happened to be one I was showing while he was drawing. But if you put the picture next to Baphomet, the, the thing that's doing like this is pointed down, mm -hmm. and in all the ones of Jesus, it's pointing up. Mm -hmm. So that uh, uh, them trying to say that it was a satanic image was really reaching, reaching really far. All right, so thank you for all that. Thank you for clearing some of that stuff up. I hope, do, do you feel better about, yeah. is there anything else that you it's, feel like you haven't touched on that you wanted to discuss as far as allegations? No, you know, I think everyone out there, uh, you know, I guess you're, people are tired of hearing you use your own discernment. You know, that's what I've been saying from the beginning. But if energetically you are drawn to the information that Bill Ryan and the Dark journal Journalist are putting out, then more power to you. If you are drawn to the uh, more spiritual ascension type information and trying to make reality a better place, then more power to you. Now, there's, like I said, there's something about these energetic changes that are pulling us and making us reveal our true natures. So. I think many people can take this an opportunity to look at how they responded to this disinfo campaign, this smear campaign. You know, use it as a mirror. Why? What triggered you to make you fall for it or jump on board with it? Um, and you know, until we all start to work on those little things about ourselves, we're, we're not going to move on spiritually or intellectually. You're, you're always going to be stuck. So. Um, you know, I've kind of been forced to deal with a lot of things. You know, I, I told you, you know, uh, there was, uh, like Kari said, there were two major things I had to deal with were uh, some issues with my marriage and with my father. And in re recent times, uh, catalysts uh, forced me to deal with, you know, long issues that needed to be dealt with in my marriage. And uh, I hadn't spoken with my dad in six years. And um, a situation popped up to where I was able to have a meeting with him 
and we were able to come together and um, in a very loving way forgive each other and move on, which was very healing for me. That This just happened right after Father's Day this, this year. So, you know, those have been major things for me spiritually to move on. And uh, people that are in, uh, jealous of me talking to beings or whatever, they're not listening very closely to what's happening because I'm not getting patted on the back or told that I'm some sort of uh, uh, messiah figure. They're sitting out, point, they're, they're constantly pointing out all my flaws. You know, I'm like, pat me on the back every once in a while, guys. <laughs> you know, the last big one was that, you know, as an INFJ and the uh, trauma I had as a child, the only, uh, being very intuitive, I could read people and I developed, I, I couldn't control my environment unless I manipulated it. And at a young age, I started becoming manipulative. And um, they pointed out to me that uh, my manipulations had caused damage to other people's free will quite a bit and uh, showed me examples of it and it just made me sick. And it was something that I've been dealing with that for about six months now, uh, you know, trying to fully understand that and make sure it's no longer a personality distortion of mine. So, you know, we've all, we've all got to do that work. Or if we focus on other people, uh, on information that goes against our truth and, and just battle, do battle with that information, then, you know, we're, we're not going to evolve. So yes, thank you to everybody for your support and sending in your questions. And I poured through over 200 of them. Actually, I poured through all of them, but there were over 200 of them. And I pulled out just a few of them. I couldn't, obviously we can't ask you all of them, but if you ever have an extra five hours of time, <laughs> we can jump on a call. Yeah. I mean, we could even do something where we do viewer questions here and there if you're interested in something like that, because there are lots of questions, lots There's of really lots, good ones. Yes. That's, and when I, uh, some of the cosmic disclosures that have been the Q, uh, Q and A episodes, viewer Q and A have been the most popular. And it seems like one of the most popular things is I usually give a talk and then afterwards I do a QA. and a So yeah, it seems to be, there seems to be a lot of questions. Yes. There's a lot of information that you cover. And I think it's interesting too, to get these questions. Cause for me watching, I've watched the majority of cosmic disclosure, not in the last six months, just because of everything that's going on, but uh, to see where people are at in your, within your testimony based on the questions right. that they're asking. It's cool. So um, let's see, do you have knowledge of interference attacks and, parentheses, specifically being orchestrated, triggered via individuals, groups, in parentheses, channeling influence, monarch, Manchurian, non-human interference. And if you have, what methods do you recommend to help those who may be unaware of this happening in the community or within themselves? Yeah, it's, it's a really big problem. It's something that uh, since, uh, uh, I guess, it, this organized campaign to attack us occurred, we started receiving also very energetic attacks uh, people um you know I, I don't know if it's people with voodoo dolls and pens you know hiding in their closet you know jabbing but you know we've had a lot of that type of stuff happen um yeah that uh recognizing it it can be a little bit diff difficult you know you have to do a lot of meditation and, and really uh look at a situation to see if it's really your own karma that you don't want to admit it, admit to, or if it is a, a negative greeting, as they say, or if it is an actual attack by the enemy. Uh, those that, uh, you know, there's, there's no one quick fix for people to deal with these attacks because every person is energetically, psychically different and they use different methods. Um, people can be taught a foundation of how to protect themselves. Um, as a matter of fact, um, I've been talking with uh, Gerald O'Donnell a little bit about developing uh, not only some of his uh, RV course, but also uh, he's been working on like a spiritual protection type thing, uh, type course. Um, I've been, you know, speaking with him to see if we can, you know, work together on that because there are a lot of questions out there and, um, and a lot of people are, are, are being told to, you know, if you need to become a psychic warrior, come to this workshop, we'll teach you how and they'll charge like, five, $8,000 and people will go and they'll spend this time and they try to teach them this cookie cutter method that may work for some people, but not everyone. So uh, when it comes to defending yourself against psychic attacks, um, 
once you identify it as a psychic attack or some sort of energetic attack, your defense method is going to be different than mine or someone else's. It's just fine-tuning that method uh, is, is the most important thing. And a comment on that too would be if you've gone to any of these courses or you've watched any of these videos or read books on how to protect yourself, you can learn that methodology that might be cookie cutter and then you know, you exactly. learn it and then you expand and grow exactly. on it, which is a lot of like yeah. how martial arts works. Right. Where you learn yeah. The, yeah. yeah. You take, take in the method and make the method your own. Yes, exactly. Cool. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, I thought this was a really interesting question. So your friend Kari from the inner earth, uh, has always enjoyed, this is Eric asked this question. So, um, the question is, so it's the blue avian contact that Corey has raw tear air. Not sure if that's spelled correctly begins his, her name with raw, which, uh, in the law of one, they say that raw is the group consciousness and then tear air is the representative in the individual form. So the question is wondering if the same concept applies to Kari. Mm -hmm. Wow. This is something that I just recently spoke with David Wilcock about. Um, yes, uh, I have used the full name Kari on purpose to see who is telling me the truth about contact when they approach me. Um, Ka is part of the name. She has me call her Ari. I don't call her Kari. It's Ari from the house of Ka. Her sister. Her name starts with Ka, but it means that they're from the house of Ka, is what it means. So that's the first time anyone's asked that question, and I've been uh, purposefully uh, keeping it out of the public eye. Interesting. Uh, All right, Eric, you're very astute. Very good. <laughs> I just told David Wilcock that one not even two or three days ago. Interesting. Synchronicity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's really cool. So it's like a last name, but it's like a first last name. It's kind of like a designation, like, you know... Uh, she used the lineage of the house of Ka, whatever that means. Okay, cool. So let's see. This is really fun. Okay. This question comes from Jonathan, and he says, if the ascension of frequencies is a normal cosmic event, some of those who are already at a higher frequency must have observed this phenomenon in the past. Have you pursued questioning them to be more specific on what to expect and when? It seems like the information coming out is pretty sparse and even vague, and yet it sounds like it would be the most profound occurrence in recorded history. Mm -hmm. So has it happened to anybody, any of the other beings before? Yes. And yes, it's, it, it happens all throughout the cosmos. And have they talked about it, I guess? Like, um, yeah, well, um, I have given information on uh, uh, Nika's people. They most recently uh, went through that process, mm -hmm. not only uh, of what we're calling an ascension process, an energetic consciousness change is what it really is. Um, they went through this consciousness renaissance already and uh, the process that they went through is similar to ours. It uh, first comes with people becoming empowered, standing up with that power, demanding the truth, and then taking that truth and creating a whole new reality. That's what his people did. That's what we're in the process of trying to do. And we have a certain time frame to be able to turn things into a optimal temporal reality. If we don't, then uh, we're, we're not going to have this beautiful future that uh, we've all dreamed about and aspired for. Okay. So, opening up about family. That's the next. So this question comes from Darren. Okay. And so he said... When I, first started, first, <laughs> when I first started following Corey online, he didn't share much about his family, which I understand completely. Lately, seems to have been uh, soon after the Chinook helicopter buzzed by his house, he's been opening up quite a bit. So his question is, how did you decide to start sharing more mm -hmm. about your family? That was very difficult. I knew that it would make some of them a target for these trolls, which, you know, is unfortunate. but. You know, one, one of the big things that, uh, I guess, Bill Ryan used to say to me is that uh, if you come out into the public, uh, they can't knock you off because then they'll be proving your story or something like that, you know. And there is a little bit of truth to that. You know, if you go public, and especially public in a big way, what if, you know, 
I, they would have knocked me off. That just would have validated a lot of what I was saying. So You become a martyr. Yeah, I become a martyr for a cause. Mm -hmm. Now, when it came to my family, we were, we were under quite a bit of threat. And it was to show my family out there, just not as being a concept, but just to see a real family. And that the threats coming in were against a real family. Another reason I started doing the vlog and become, being more public was that a lot of people were saying that I was trying to build myself up as a messiah figure and all this when I'm just a regular guy. Um, anyone that spent time with me knows I'm just a regular guy. I don't walk around with airs like I'm spiritually above everyone, you know, and so I, I, I don't do that. And uh, I wanted to chronicle that and show people kind of like who I really am so that they wouldn't look up to me because the whole point of this blue avian message is not to find someone to pray to or look up to it is to look within take all of that energy that you're spending out here and use it within and if you focus within and start fixing things in yourself then like i say uh, you're going to make the world a better place one person at a time This question is from a person that is retired military. So I'm retired Air Force. I remember while in college, when I was in ROTC, I was very curious, maybe a little bit obsessed about UFOs. And I frequently thought to myself, I wanted to get involved in the process of discovery more about them firsthand. I knew for certain the Air Force was keeping tons of information from the public, and I knew I wanted to get involved. My question is, if I was inadvertently part of something I no longer remembered, how could I find out? How can we find out if we've ever been blank slated? Would you recommend hypnosis? First of all, regression therapy can be a wonderful tool, but you, someone that just puts up a shingle and says, I'm a regression therapist, can do more damage. They can implant memories, uh, not meaning to. Uh, they can front load you with information. Uh, you know, like say some information that becomes a part of your psyche. In it. So you have to be very careful. Um, people that have had, you know, a good five, 10 years of experience doing it, I, I would check their references and the, before considering, uh, but regression therapy is a double-edged sword. It's a, it can be a, a beautiful thing, but it can also cause a lot of problems. Now, how do you know, um, if you have missing time during the time you served in the military, if, uh, you have dreams of occurrences that did not happen consciously in your service, your memories consciously of being in the service, then there's a good chance that uh, you were being blank slated. In the Air Force especially, there are many, in civilian contractors, they are blank slated at the end of every day of work. They'll go home not remembering anything that they did at work, and they've accepted that that's a part of the job. So the but uh, a lot of people that have been in the military have been involved in things that they don't remember. Um, it has to, you, you have to have some sort of an inkling that it happened to you before you start going to like a regression therapist, you know, but you usually will have some sort of an idea. If they're a part of something like what you were a part of, like the 20 and back, if they are going off planet and then they're coming back and then, so they're actually traveling back in time they won't experience missing time, right? right. No, so no, no, no. are there any other ways that you could tell if you've been uh, being well, like the, uh, yeah, the, the having dreams, the memories coming back, first of all, in your dreams, uh, you having like uh, PTSD, but with no real explanation to connect to the PTSD. Uh, those are some signs, but in the military, uh, the, the, most of the people in the 20, back, 20 and back programs were military. Very few were civilian assets, and I happen to be one of them. Okay. Okay. Great answer. So this is a follow-up. How many people were – do you know how many people were part of the 20 and back? And, like, when it started, how long it lasted, and when, if it's still going on, like um, – I'm told that uh, most re – that, uh, that it's still being used within the military – but they are using a lot of cloning technology now, uh, a lot more, to where uh, they're using disposable human beings that they clone. Uh, they're starting to use that as a, uh, a method now to have manpower because there are so many things that can go wrong with uh, 
you know, putting a person back in their life. Um, you know, afterwards, it can start uh, having the memories come back. Uh, you know, weird behavior uh, can can occur. So, and, and, and it's harder to keep the secret. So there could be a gigantic cloning operation going on in Antarctica, and then they're just shipping them off world. Yep. Sounds like a really good sci-fi movie. It does, doesn't it? Let's make that one next. Let's see. Okay. So, what is your opinion of some of these other people, you don't have to use names, that have come out as saying that they were also part of the secret space program? Like, how has that affected you? I guess turning that question back on you. Yeah, I mean, you know, I've discussed the fact that uh, some of the intelligence people said that they were going to super soldier the secret space program topic. Uh, basically, uh, some people came out that were part of super soldier programs, which, you know, they're uh, in, uh, mentally and physically enhanced to do certain, you know, uh, operations. Uh, these people were starting to come out and tell their story and to dilute the information they started uh, manipulating people to believe that they were a part of it. And then all of a sudden, now you have like 800 people going to a convention saying, I'm a super soldier, I'm a super soldier. When probably one to 3% of them were actually in the program, the rest are their sub subterfuge. Um, they were gonna do the same thing with the secret space program. And uh, all the people, all these people come up with wild stories that are you know, similar to mine uh, about being in the space program. At the same time, we have people that are watching Cosmic Disclosure and reading information about it online that are being that are having like actual triggers of memories and and that kind of a thing. So uh, it's become kind of diluted. It's hard to really tell unless I spend time with them who is uh, you know giving the real information. And quite honestly, it's not my place to go out and say you know all these people are telling the truth and are not. Um, I did that <clears throat> on uh, uh, one occasion where the person was causing a little bit of damage, I was told. But for the most part, uh, you know, I just let people share their information. Uh, the rest of the world can take it or leave it. Fair enough. Okay, so, let's see. Oh, I thought this was really interesting. Phyllis asked a question about uh, brain and memory erase, is what she called it. Is there any correlation to your brain erase the same as people who are incarnated who don't remember who they were prior to this birth is it the same thing so with the blank slating slash what i call soul amnesia mm -hmm. you know there there are a lot of similarities i really can't answer that question other than to speculate mm -hmm. but you know how people a uh, few people seem to be able to have bleed through recall of past life memories while others are not mm -hmm. uh, there's there are a lot of correlations there to where it looks like some, uh, uh, before we enter this life we are blank slated uh, in a much deeper way mm -hmm. than, than the way the military program does that's a pretty interesting correlation yeah I had never thought of that before until yeah. that question came in from Phyllis and I thought she's making me think a little bit sure. it was a cool thought yeah, there's really some bright uh, viewers <laughs> yeah that, that, watch this information yeah a lot of these emails i was getting and i was just sitting there like, oh man it's just like question after question are great question yeah. so that's one of the things that's so you know humbling i'm the, there's so many really spiritual people in this community and i'll be standing on stage and i'll feel the spiritual energy coming from them and i'm humbled because i'm sitting there and i'm talking to a lot of these people and i'm sharing concepts that I don't need to be explaining to them. They could probably explain to me better. You know? There's a lot more spiritual people, a lot more spiritually developed, you know, than I am that are in this community. And uh, it's it can be hum humbling sometimes. I've, you know, at meet and greets, you know, you'll meet, like someone will come up and like a lot of these ladies, they have this goddess energy about them. They'll come up to you uh, and, and give you a hug and you feel like this just beautiful, loving goddess energy, you know, that I mean, the energy from these people is amazing. That's awesome. Yeah. I bet that had a huge effect on you coming out of just like the dark place where you feel like you're alone and then being able yeah. to finally like come out yeah. into the, the real world. Yeah. 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 Okay. So let's see what do we have here. 
Oh, I just said real world, and that's the very next question, synchronicity. Your experience with this situation mirrors back your own life experiences where it feels like you're living in two separate realities, one spiritually based and the other one materialistic and limited. Our goal seems to be to acclimate and balance these two forces. How do you achieve that balance without getting caught up in all the noise of this reality? Is it also difficult to progress spiritually when in this duality? Yeah, it's, uh, it's very hard to progress spiritually. I mean, the, a lot of people have seen the progress I've made over the last couple of years. It's been hard fought. I mean, it's been very difficult. I mean, a lot of people think, you know, are putting out, you know, Corey's making all this money for making up stuff for the show, and he's just kicking back, you know, laughing at everybody. It's not the case. <clears throat> you know, I'm, like I stated before, I'm being forced to work on some really uh, uncomfortable things about myself. And... If you're not willing to do that, then you're not going to grow uh, spiritually or, uh, you know, in this reality. You know, you know, you'll find yourself, you know, stuck in jobs. You're, you'll find yourself never evolving as a person. You'll look back five years ago, you're pretty much the same exact person as you are now. That, that, is, a, that is a cycle that we've got to break. You know, we have to... Look back six months ago and see, wow, I've changed this, this, and this. You've got to see progress or you're going to get discouraged. And people that become discouraged, that happens through fear. And, you know, fear leads to hate and hate leads to the dark side. <laughs> so um, I think that's why a lot of people are being drawn to the dark side right now. How are some of the ways that you're progressing spiritually? Do you, are there books that you're reading, people that you follow, or is no, it meditative work? You know, I'm not a real big book reader. Um, I mean, I've got some, some books that I've read. Um, <clears throat> most of the spiritual guidance I'm getting is, uh, you know, through Kari. Kari, I guess I can say that. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so a lot of the healing and spiritual growth that I'm having is occurring, you know, through Kari. She is, um, uh, you know, really spending a lot of time forcing me to focus on things that are holding me back. And I still have quite a bit to work on. I am nowhere near perfect. Uh, my wife can tell you that. But uh, I'm trying. And uh, I think that's the, the biggest thing, is that you have to try. You have to put in the effort. If you sit back and are waiting for something magical to happen to you, you're going to be disappointed. You have to go out and seek out the magic. Be the magic. Be the magic. <laughs> okay, so let's... So our next question comes from Sydney. And she says, How would one discern if the Blue Avians were from the true light of the creator and not the false light of an imposter race? I've heard that the Blue Avians are an Illuminati mind control program and that high-level members at parties put on a Blue Avian headdress. <laughs> yeah, the... Uh... A lot of this goes back to ancient Egypt when the, the Blue Avians tried to intervene uh, one other time to, to get us to, to, to change. Uh, the uh, information that they brought was used as a control system and adopted by the Illuminati. Now, I have not seen any, anything about a blue bird mask being worn at any type of Illuminati functions. That's, you know, people are just kind of making stuff up and putting it out there. Um, a lot of people are saying, you know, uh, the Blue Avians are actually the reptilians in disguise. Uh, some of the military are, are trying to uh, make all this fit in their little box, and they're like, well, uh, we know the Nordics uh, do a lot of manipulation of humanity. We think it's, it's the Nordics that are creating the Blue Avians. So, you know, there's, you know, you do have to use discernment. And the biggest discernment I think you can use is, you know, what is the message? Is it a message of disempowerment? Um, I hear a lot of people out there that are saying uh, service to others is a psyop. It's a way to get us to uh, give away our sovereignty and think of other people and, and not think about ourselves and our own growth. And... <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. That's funny because as soon as you started talking about that, <coughs> I started getting, <coughs> I might get some water really quick. Holy crap, <coughs> that's really funny. <coughs> oh, 
Some energies probably don't want you talking about that. Mm. I think the best way for anyone to discern whether something's coming from the light or the dark, it, it all goes back to you know a tree by its fruit, um, is truly a message of forgiving, forgiving yourself and forgiving others for damage that they've done is that Illuminati or Luciferian. Is uh, uh, the fact that they want you to be, think thoughtful of other people, service to others. Is that Luciferian? Is that, you know, it, it just doesn't bear out. Everything that, that all of the information that the Blue Avians have delivered has been positive, empowering, and lit, uplifting spiritually. It has not, there has not been any type of negativity or divisive information. So, okay. We have a question from Andreas from Germany. Do you ever get confused? How do you manage your memory? If you've experienced more than 120 and back, do you get confused about your timelines? Yes. Now, the, uh, the 320 and backs occurred, uh, the last one I believe was in 1997. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> those two are mostly still suppressed because of the mind. Those seem to be the darkest things I was involved in. It was during the, the last two. Now, I'm meeting with Gonzalez quite often because I'm having memory issues, uh, signs of uh, temporal dementia that uh, occur from uh, being a part of these 20 and back programs and being around torsion drives and all the uh, heavy fields involved with the technology. So, you know, uh, you know, that is affecting my memory. Now, one of the things that's been occurring that's pretty crazy is that I've been having these weird episodes where I'm flashing back to one of these 20 and backs that I don't have full memory of. Um, it's a weird thing. I, I will, all of a sudden, I will feel kind of confused and then bilocated, like I'm not, I'm somewhere else. And then I'll look around and the latest one was I was in a, uh, a full bio suit walking around uh, what looked like a very ancient facility. Uh, and I was walking with a team of people also all in, in these bio suits. And uh, all of a sudden I went up against the wall, put my hands up against the wall and was feeling all like I, I was, didn't kind of like, didn't know who I was, where I was, what was going on, but I was looking around and uh, this woman's grabbing my helmet, looking at me, trying to talk to me. And she said, and she's telling someone else, it's happening again. It's happening again. So it's like, uh, it's not just your memory. You, your soul has like a zero time reference. Mm -hmm. And when you're being pulled out of that time reference and put back in and you have like 20 years of memory, your psyche has to try to make sense of that. You know, it's, they're stacking the 20 years on top of each other. And then it, it you know, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it can be, if I had full recall of the other two, it would, uh, I would probably be in the same state of uh, being almost suicidal. So it's like your soul is existing in two places at once and you can go between those two. Yeah, it's, um, it's weird. It's almost like uh, I would be sitting here now and then all of a sudden bilocate to that other timeline mm -hmm. and me and the other timeline is affected by me connecting to it. And it causes me to like, in that timeline to also be like, Whoa, what's going on? It's like There's your something. astral projecting from here to there. Something. Yeah. And they, maybe you on that other timeline is feeling that interference. Yeah. There's something like that. Going on. Yeah. It's really weird. There are, there are a lot of weird things. And then psychologically, uh, your subconscious is trying to make sense out of, three timelines or four timelines stacked on top of each other. And uh, your subconscious is trying to keep that in line with your zero time reference of, you know, the timeline that it knows linear time. Mm -hmm. And it's hard for your psyche to make sense of it. How frequently does that happen? It's only happened a few times. Okay. Yeah. When was the first time it happened? The first time was right after Gonzalez told me 
uh, about the uh, two extra 20 and backs, uh, more details about it and, and uh, how it was affecting me. And he was doing work on me uh, to try to uh, alleviate some of the issues I was having. Interesting. So when you're, when you're away on the 20 and back, do you know, I mean, this might be a dumb question, but do you know that you're on the 20 and back? Like, do you know that you're going to be, so maybe when you're there on that timeline, you started thinking about you here on earth and there was a connection there as well. Yeah. So that Einstein Rosenbridge is created <laughs> <laughs> between timeline timelines. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. Thank you to everybody for submitting questions and thank you, Corey, so much for coming on the show. And I wanted to end with letting you talk a little bit about Eclipse of Disclosure. Yes, we're gonna have a huge event in McLeod, California. It is real close to Mount Shasta. It is gonna be an awesome event of about 500 people, like-minded, positive people coming together to, to be with their tribe, as we call it. And uh, we're going to have a lot of uh, good speakers and workshops. We're going to have, let's see, uh, Jay Widener is our keynote. We have Bentinho Massaro. Dr. Sala is going to be there. Laura Eisenhower. Uh, I think Clifford Mahoudi is going to be there. Um, let's see, who am I missing? Um, not, not, not only that, uh, but we have... Uh, a lot of uh, people that are going to be giving workshops on what, you know. Eric walk. Rains, I think, Eric is doing. Rains, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'll be doing a workshop. Yes, I'm doing a workshop. Uh, I know that Jordan. Jordan will be doing one. Jordan Sather. Yes. And, and uh, Justin Deschamps. Justin Deschamps. I think he's actually speaking. I don't know who. I think he's a speaker, yes. Okay. Yes. Um, let's see. Uh, um, we have uh, uh, Vivian Davis is going to be doing a presentation on the post-disclosure project that has, that has to do with the... Uh, psychology initiative of developing a uh, post post disclosure plan to help people cope. Uh, the, uh, I think that they're going to be doing some uh, pretty interesting workshops on, on on different things such as the Law of One. So it's, it's going to be very cool. It's going to be very fun. Uh, in 2016 in Mount Shasta, it was just Dr. Sala, Laura Eisenhower, and myself speaking, and we had over 300 people. It was packed. Everybody loved it. It was a place where so many beautiful things were born. So many people came together on this mission. Uh, we're looking really forward to it. Who's throwing the event and how did you guys, like, isn't it Full Disclosure Project? Yes, uh, Full Disclosure Project. Uh, uh, Roger's doing a lot of the work, but we have, uh, you know, like Adrian. Uh, we've, uh, we've got a lot of people on our team that are really uh, helping uh, get this uh, organized. But this is going to be our first um, production as uh, a group. So we're really excited about it. That's awesome. Can't wait. And when is it? It is uh, during the eclipse in August, August 18th through I believe the 23rd. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes. Awesome. And uh, uh, we have uh, a link to brown paper tickets where you can buy, uh, buy your tickets. Uh, we're also going to webcast it. It's not going to be live streamed because of uh, the technology isn't going to work with us there, but uh, we're going to be doing webcasts that people can purchase if you can't be there. But we really want to see you there. I want to meet you. This is going to be an event where it's going to be, uh, there's going to be a lot of interaction between the speakers and the people attending. We really want to see you there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again, Corey. And thank you guys. And make sure to subscribe to The Divine Frequency. And if you have any questions or comments, please email me at thedivinefrequency at gmail.com. Thanks, guys. Bye. Action. Action. Okay. I am your cult leader. <laughs> I command you act. <laughs> Submit yourself before me now. Well, thank you, Corey. <laughs> <laughs> You're such a wonderful cult leader. I just thought. Yes. That's why everyone follows me. I'm so demanding. So, uh, thank you. What? Here, here, here's some Kool Aid. Oh, sweet! <laughs> <laughs>